This broadcast from IOF TV is brought to you by Tikator and Lumonite. Welcome back to live coverage of the European Orienteering Championships coming to you from Northern Italy. We've moved to the very picturesque town of Suave for the only relay competition of these championships, the sprint relay. It is, of course, the usual format, two men and two women in the team, a mass start, some gaffling, some forking in the mix there. And this is uh, the town that they will be navigating through its glorious conditions today fantastic for sprinting and it's very very interesting that we've only got one team per nation today so the team selections i'm sure will of course the coaches uh, maybe a few headaches on on some of the teams as they put all of their eggs in one basket for what is going to be a very flat and fast race and hopefully lots of excitement as well there's quite a few uh orienteering tourists who've made their way uh, to spectate these races. And there you can see uh, the castle of Suave in the distance as well. There will be a little bit of a, a climb up towards that castle, but you can see these kind of maze of uh, older houses and a kind of a bit of a grid system as well that they have to navigate around. Uh, again, the courses are on the short side and they will go off the women first and the women last with the two men in the middle as well. So it's set to be a very, very exciting one. Uh, and of course, we'll have our two favourite teams as usual. We see Sweden and Switzerland in amongst the favourites as always, but there could be a good old uh, battle for bronze. Uh, what do you think, Jonas, of how the teams line up? Yeah, you have said it all already you know um, mm -hmm. definitely we are gonna have two teams uh, they are the big favorites they have won almost all of the championships races the last year so definitely for me it's gonna be a fight between sweden and switzerland but as you said it's very open for this third position and of course one of the first two favorite teams they can miss out as well because you mentioned it before it's not as in the world cup uh, race we only have one team per nation so if that if there's a mistake in this one um then then they will have not the possibility to have the second team uh, backing up for them but let's take a look at the map you see here uh be careful now because it's a difference between the women's and the men's leg here we see all the options at once a long leg to the first control then the courses are splitting up so depending on what forking you have you have another loop in the beginning and of course it's a difference between the men's and the women's course as well first tv control at control five um, and then they split up again. You go back into this old town for a few controls, a short loop. See, this is the second forking there at around control seven. Then this sh very short loop uh, just at the foot of the castle, as you mentioned before, before we go back towards the arena. Uh, there is a map flip up there in this kind of park area as well. And then there's a very short last loop here uh, no forking on this one. So the difference you see here is just the difference between the men and the women's course. It's 
it's kind of it's, it's kind of difficult to understand if you look at it here because as i said we have the men's and the women's course in one you will it it will be easier to understand once we have them separated yeah let's take another look at this long leg then this is mm. one of the the first controls of course there's several different first controls uh and the barriers <laughs> in the place means that there's different distances but I mean, to go all the way around on that red route, that's very extreme. I don't think anybody's well, going to do yeah, that. Yeah, I was about to say, it looks very good on the graphics here with three different options. Well, there are two different options. It's the, the blue and the light blue one. Uh, the other one is around 150 to 200 meters longer. So if you take the red one there, you will lose a lot of time, which is incredibly difficult to win back in a course like this. Uh, so an absolute no-go to go on the red route there. Here's one of the options, the dark blue one. Actually, there's a difference of about, I think, 10 meters if you take the light blue one, which would be to round this artificial barrier in the middle section to the left and then get back into this dark blue one. So it doesn't really matter what you do to this first control. Even if you have the other forking, you should go on either the dark blue or the light blue one. So um, in the end, no matter what you have, you, it's a good idea to stay together with the pack to the first control and then you split up at the very end here towards the control. But, well, there's no need to take any different route to this first control, no matter which control you have. No, and nobody will want to be taking risks. So that red route doesn't work for, for any of them, it seems. Let's have a look at this next control, 12 and 13. Again, not mm. much difference at all here. Well, it, yeah, it, it's, I mean, you can take whatever you want, basically. If you take the one uh, in between there, it might be a bit more difficult to read ahead. But it doesn't matter when it comes to distance. You have one more corner to take. So I think the red one is quite okay, but there's no other option. So it's either to go like this one, the red one, or to go between the buildings. But in the end, it, it yeah, it will differ maybe one or two seconds. So just giving you a little sense of what it actually looks like in the town. Um, some of those stairs, some of the characteristics of those alleyways as well. But the teams, of course, really, really uh, well prepared by this. And in, if you look across the whole course, um, you know, as you were saying, it's really hard to see from the initial graphic, but not many forkings across the whole course. Were you surprised? Uh, uh, I'm very surprised. I mean, we, when we have seen the, the last sprint relays, the last one, if you just take the one in Czechia, we had many forkings, they were very decisive, they're different uh, routes you should take uh, according to what kind of uh, forking you have. And I miss that today, really. It's, it's, it's as it was in the sprint, in the individual sprint, it's going to be very uh, fast and not so many challenges. Of course, as a runner, when you're out there, you don't notice that because you don't know about the other fork and stuff like that. But if you sit here with the map, it's it, it would be surprising for me if they split up too much. Of course, it, they can take left or right every now and then, but it's they would go to get together again if they have the same speed. Right, let's talk through the teams. You can see Tova Alexanderson there wearing number one. Uh, Sweden, of course. Simone Abasold leading out the Swiss team. They are a team uh, Abasold has on Kibbutz and Roos who've been together a lot in exactly that same team. Rio Larsson will lead out the Norwegians. You saw, just saw Jana Petter over there leading out the Czechs. Uh, Inka Nermanen just missed out on qualification a couple of days ago. She was 16th in the qualifier. She leads off the Finnish team. France Isia Basse, again, very, very close to making that uh, qualification into the sprint final for Isia Basse. Denmark, all of their team did qualify for the finals. Uh, Ida Egeri Christiansen will lead out their team and Hannah Wisniewska will be uh, on the first leg for the Polish team as well on that list there that is the top eight by rankings I don't know if we're going to have a look through any of the others you've already mentioned the Great Britain team watch out as well for Sandra Grosberger on the first leg the uh, Latvian you can just see the British team there Charlotte Ward 
uh, on the first leg for them. It's a very compact arena, and you can see all the teams are on the start line, just ready to go in the next few seconds. They've got no idea of the challenge that awaits them, but we do have all of those teams getting ready to go. We've got 25 teams on this start list for this European Championships and they are underway so 25 teams straight out of the start you can see they are unfurling their maps and it's not a, it's a very short route out to the start and then we'll see which way they go they're all they're and all going to come towards the camera so that maybe looks like they're going to do the light blue route yeah it looks like that i mean there's still the risk for a few of the runners that they go on the red one because you can turn to the left uh, a bit later uh, very soon. I uh, hope no one of the teams will do that because that would be a time loss, definitely. But Let's it looks as if they all go. Amongst the runners, then. Yeah, they've all gone straight on. Yeah, to the light blue one, the one we haven't seen in the picture, but it's they have to take a left turn here uh, in order to uh, not get yeah, into this artificial in barrier. barrier. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've seen them Whoever for a few teams. There were a few teams uh, going straight there, so they will have to turn or then take a right turn, which is a bit longer. So now they are going against the town walls, these old walls here, and then we say they are, yeah, it looks like at least all of the top teams going exactly this same route, this light blue route to the first control, even though they've all got quite a few different controls. It's quite a big forking in terms of the the very very different shape forkings um again which is quite unusually for us to see in a sprint relay mm. and we had actually it was denmark and poland that went straight there they will go to uh go around to the right uh, you can see it here poland actually heading back again uh, but they will lose time on this so then denmark will probably lose a bit less time but they will lose time as well if you go all the way to there, should you just go back? Uh, I mean, all the way. No, I think you can go the way Denmark is going, but you will lose time doing it, um, definitely. But it's not yeah, a good start. Maybe for they just didn't see the. They just didn't see the out of bounds or something. The the, the barrier. Yeah, I mean, definitely Wisniewska didn't see it because she turned. Uh, maybe that Denmark. Uh, actually planned to go there. So all in one big train at the moment. They're just kind of passing the fifth control, which is the TV control, going in the other direction. Uh, so they're looking for the bridge over the river, which you can see in the distance. It's hard at the moment, I think, for us to pick out who's exactly in the lead. But no, we've definitely got Sweden and Switzerland uh, uh, towards the front of that pack. I think that there may be the figures we can see there just crossing this car park. Yeah, and I mean, uh, we know that they don't have the same control here in the beginning so they're splitting up and in my opinion it will be i mean we have the strongest runners of those teams on the first leg uh, physically uh, so they should be able to make a difference here already on the first leg and i think that's the tactics of the team of switzerland and sweden why they set to valexander and uh, especially someone i resolved for switzerland on the first leg yeah, it's, it's very interesting to kind of see how the tactics have almost changed in the last few years for those teams. You'd always tend to put your strongest runners on the at the end of the relay on the last few legs and as still some of the teams are are doing that you look at maybe czechia finland as well yeah. um but why is it important for for sweden and switzerland that they that they do this well i think it's it's sweden that actually started with it putting two Alexanders on on the first leg and if you put two on the first leg then i think the smart move for switzerland is to put simona on the first leg again as well because you don't want to be behind after the first leg so you want to have your physically strongest runner on the first leg as well yeah in order to not lose time on this one in order to not be in a situation here where you have to be attacking a lot and i think especially today yeah it's a good thing if you don't have to be attacking because what should you be there's no there are not so many root choices you can be attacking actually yeah, and it's going to be interesting to see how this route choice splits people up. Will there be a slower one? It looks like B is a lot slower. Is yeah, it, you know, you should, slower than you A. Should go, 
I think it's a, a few meters shorter if you would turn to north from B3 and go around to the north. Uh, and take this street. No one is doing that. Everyone is passing to the south. But you could head out from this little park and go around on the street. Um, but it looks a bit faster, the A option. I agree with that. Okay, so Tova Alexanderson there. You can see she's just nipping in to punch the fourth control, which is just out of view. And then here is the fifth control on this picnic bench here. And, you know, she will see that she's managed to get a gap. This is exactly as Team Sweden were hoping for, hoping that Tova Alexanderson can make a gap and that it maybe takes the pressure off the rest of the team and they can just maintain that lead. That's certainly the tactic they've been trying to maintain. But here comes Abersold in second place. 14 seconds is the gap. I think this is Hungary next. They've had a fantastic, they've got really two really strong women. It's Victoria Marg on their first leg. Said watch out for Sandra Grosberger. She was seventh in the uh, sprint final, so doing very well. There's Charlotte Ward for Great Britain, Maria Olausen for Norway as well. We've got Finland still in the mix. I think that's Ukraine. So the main teams that would we would be looking out for they're all up in the front still there's mm -hmm. Czechia just want to watch out for them as well and I mean something we can say as well is we have seen the difference now between the two forking options but if you look at it distance wise uh, there shouldn't be any difference so if there is a difference it's just in how easy it is to execute or I mean regarding not technically but regarding how many corners you have to take how much you have to slow down on uh, the way to the controls, but distance-wise, there is almost no difference on the two loops. So another long leg here to control number six. Again, fairly simple to execute. You know, it's just going to be around here on the right. Mm, and, and something no we problem. can say we can say here is that there is a forking coming on this one as well. Uh, very soon and. Oh no, it's not a forking coming. It's, it's, it's a forking after on the, the next it's stream. after yeah. the yeah, it's after the um bit around the castle. The castle bit I think it's gonna be quite fun. It's I'm it's kind of ashamed that there's no forking there because there's so many controls close together. Um it'll be interesting to see the kind of chaos that's um formed around that, but uh it's still gonna be quite good to catch all of the runners here. So this is control number six. There's Latvia, Great Britain. We missed Hungary as well. Britain staying ahead of Norway and Finland could also be in contention. Remember Thomas Heikela getting that bronze medal a couple of days ago. You can see here and it's very the climbing start uh, towards this hill we've been talking about. You can see here this is the open bit. Uh, we have to be careful here with all the... It's, it's almost like a maze. Be careful where you can get through, but you see it here. It's like terraces. Yep, so you can see Tova Alexanderson climbing these steps up this terrace. Then there's a control on, in on the left. Uh, you've also got those uh, advertisement hoardings there as well, just to kind of keep. And has uh, she stopped? I can see some hesitation there. Yeah, you can see the control, but this is so. This is why I wondered that. Would the athletes be quite kind of confused that there's no forking here? Uh, well, maybe, but they won't. They wouldn't notice. But the thing is that I think Tuve would have been able to leave the stairs there, but she didn't yeah. really dare to. She was afraid. Well, to you've got to be so careful about. Her. You've got to be so careful, I think, about the um, what is out of bounds and what isn't. Mm, definitely. Uh, but you can see that uh, she lost time here, that's for sure. Mm. Abersold closer now, and you can see that all the other runners on the way up the stairs now. And there's a control just in underneath those trees as well. That's where they have the mat flip. Um, and then there's another closed control in the, one of the buildings. You can see them going down the stairs.
a lot of hesitating at these controls, trying to figure out exactly where you can and can't go. I think it's a bit confusing for them because it's like a small wall next to the stairs. So it looks in the terrain, it looks as if it would be could be forbidden to go to jump over there. But on the map, it, it is open, so it's free to to get off uh, just almost everywhere, anywhere. But hard to see yeah, when you're in competition mode. Yeah, and teams are wanting to be super safe. It's a relay. You have to be super safe. But you can see there, Control 11, that's the one it's just after all of this. Absolt just ahead of Alexanderson. And here's the two of them basically back together here. So this and now this is, is where we have the thick walking. Exactly. And they should split up. They don't have the same control at this point. You see it here. But on the other side of that building, they should get together again. It's very short forking, uh, but forked so, over two controls. So big group here with Isia Basse from France at the tail end of it. Here's Elena Babic from Ukraine as well. Ems de Small from Belgium. Annika Rima, they've got Evely Kasku on the last leg for them. Let's have a replay then of what exactly happened here. You can see there is spaces you can leave those stairs, but you just it's really yeah, hard to it, tell that you can on that map. If, if you remember how it looked in the terrain, you could see that it, because the, the stairs were climbing up, of course, uh, you got this small wall to the left of it. And it was hard to understand that you actually are allowed to jump over the wall at uh, at a few times, but on other times you're not allowed to. So you have to be very careful reading the map. And this is what you were saying earlier, that it's good to stay with the pack, um, e even on these forkings, because it makes sense for, for both runners, even if you're on the different forkings, to go the same way. Yeah, but of course they don't know, but there's no need. No. I mean, you can feel that, you can feel that, yeah. I mean, usually you, you kind of, wait a little bit and see what the other is doing. Of course, not really waiting, but you, you get a feeling what the other is doing. And then if he or she is do, doing something else, then you look on the map again and double check if that's not an option for you as well. And I mean, today, every time you double check, you should see that, okay, that's an option for me as well. So Tova Alexanderson just pulling away further and further ahead of Simona Abasold. But for us, it's no surprise these two women are a class apart from a lot of the other first leg runners here. So to get the two of them, uh, have the gap on the rest of the field is no surprise. And all the four kings are done now uh, on this first leg. So it's just the same uh, routes for all of them and not really any route choices either. Mm -hmm. And as it looks now, I think Team Switzerland might be more happy with this first leg than S Team Sweden. If you see, if you just look back how it developed, that we actually had the gap already after a few controls and then had these struggles in the middle. So uh, for Switzerland, it would be very, very good if Abisol could keep in in touch here so that she can send out to we had on in, well, at least to get more or less together with, uh, yeah, with Swedish runner. Yeah, but now we wait for the next runners through. We are looking for Hungary. Victoria Mark has had a fantastic race. She was 21st in uh, the sprint a couple of days ago, uh, and the women for Hungary are with the men. Rita Maramorosi, of course, three times junior world champion uh, this year was 18th in the sprint. So very strong uh, female runners for Team Hungary. Great to see them in current third position. And then after Hungary through, we have quite a group of some of those who have been named as favorites for the bronze medal. So we've got Norway there, Latvia, Finland, Great Britain and France. So a group of five athletes all going through there very, very close. Like we're even doing our timing to a tenth of a second as well. So last part of this race, of this first leg, is 
fairly straightforward in terms of the orienteering. It is all about the pace, all about the speed, and especially when it's easy, just trying to keep everything together, making no mistakes whatsoever. That was the 18th control in the distance. Here's Tova Alexanderson doing her job for the most part, and how much of a gap has she got ahead of Switzerland? It looks like it's grown from the six seconds we saw. So no surprises as we see Tova Alexanderson crossing the line first. Leading out Jonathan Gustafsson, sixth a couple of days ago in the sprint championships. Here's Simona Abersold working hard on the last few metres to hand over to Joey Haddon. And the gap is 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So losing nine seconds just in that last loop, which is pretty much all running. And I mean, you can get a feeling what could have happened if Tuve would not have hesitated in the middle of the course there. Mm. Uh, she could have come back here with a 45 seconds gap. But now it's only 15 seconds. And I think that's that's a gap that actually Joey Haddon maybe could get closer to because every now and then you, he might be able to see Jonathan Gustafsson. So Hungary through into third place. Victoria Mark handing over to Zoltan Pedoso. Then we have a fight now to who is going to come in in fourth. Sandra Grosberger looking very good. Mario Lawson then and Charlotte Ward followed by Inka Nermanen and Isia Basse. This group of five together stretching from fourth to eighth place, fourth to ninth place even. So Latvia handing over in that group first. We wait for the next to exchange. Ukraine, Estonia, a minute and a half down. We also have Belgium. Watch out for Denmark coming through very soon as well after that mistake from uh, Ida Egerberg Christensen to the first control. Czechia also in this group. They'll hand over to Wojciech Kral. So there's Denmark. Denmark handing over to Søren Trana Erdem. And there's Czechia. Jana Petrova handing over to Wojciech Kral. And uh, Wojciech Kral, one of the most, ex or the most experienced in this field when it comes to sprint relays. I know you've been doing some stats, Jonas. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been checking all the championships races we had in sprint relay uh, from the very first race back in 2014 that was also held in Italy. So including the world championships and the European championships, he didn't miss one single championship race in sprint relay. So he's up in 10 championships races in sprint relay for the Czech Republic. That's pretty incredible. What's the most experienced team that we've got here? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the individual runners and you add up all the championship races, you can see that uh, Switzerland actually has uh, 20 starts at championships, which is the most experienced team uh, at the start line here. Today, uh, if we compare that to other teams, the Czech team is quite experienced as well with 18 starts. Uh, a bit surprising, the Swedish team only nine starts, so rather unexperienced but but of course it's because we have the <laughs> the two runners who did, do they their first start uh, martin Riekborn and jonathan gustafsson now i'm talking only about uh, appearances Spring in championships so yeah. not yeah and, and not in the world cup races of course you can also see here a mistake by joey haddon uh, heading out first to the left from the start and then going back in this uh, dark blue route as we called it uh in the graphics just before the start so i think he lost about 10 to 15 seconds by kind of changing from the light to the dark blue option that looks like the group uh germany czechia denmark all in there Lithuania as well. A 
a chasing group and then they'll come back over that bridge and we'll get the time check at the sixth control. Mm, I can see um, we have ca slightly different loops here now. But here's the leader, Jonathan Gustafsson, and looking very smooth through there. Smooth and fast. And we wait now. The gap was 15 seconds, but we yes. saw there was a route choice error from Joey Haddon. So we'll see what the gap has grown to. There's Joey Haddon crossing the bridge. And you expect the hillier parts of this race to suit him very well. Mm, but you can see that he lost a lot mm. of time here in the beginning. Almost half a minute. <sighs> that is really not want, how you want to start your race. Especially when, you know, your job as first and second leg runners is just to have a very stable race. We can be back behind Gustafsson as we look out. This is the third leg. Sorry, the third place team. Sotan Bajoso still in third place, but being chased down by the French team here. Adrien Delaine. We also have Finland. Norway and Great Britain still in that group with Latvia dropping down from the start to the end of that pack mm -hmm. so and all those teams still kind of within touching distance though yeah and what you can say is that they didn't lose uh, any time compared to Gustafsson so quite the same speed there for this group in the very beginning of the course so back with the leader this is so they will do the, um, the forking, kind of this, this forking with the two controls by the steps earlier on. Mm, so they do it before they go into this open area, into this park orienteering. So they are on the forking now. And I would say that there is a clearly shorter option uh, on this forking here. And I think that Switzerland has the shorter one now here on the second leg you can see it here in my opinion d is longer because you pass kind of the c control anyway or almost and is there is there an order that you want to have the long and the short ones yeah i mean it's it's it, in the situation as it is right now it doesn't really matter because they're not in they don't see each other but if you see each other of course it's a good thing to have the longer for first because then it's easier to get back again and close the gap but in the situation as it is right now i don't think it matters too much so these athletes have nearly the same kind of group of controls uh compared to what we saw for the women's courses and we can see jonathan gustafsson just punching control 12 there looking mm, being very i was gonna say i was gonna yeah. say looking pretty good but now he's figuring out exactly what tova alexanderson could was doing is when can you kind of leave the stairs and you can leave the stairs there you can see the control just in the picture and now you have to go all the way around you can see some of those walls have got tape at the top yeah, just to mark where you're not allowed to jump over. You can see that Sweden is losing time here again, hesitating. Chance for Joey Hadorn in this uphill to get close. And my feeling is now that the gap is much less than it was before. Maybe a little bit uh, due to the forking before, but definitely also due to the hesitations by Gustafsson. 
Yeah, but still, you can see Joe Haddon's not quite sure either exactly where he's going to go. And that's what happens when you're leading the race. You don't have those others ahead to kind of show uh, what is going on and what you've got to do. Here's the next group then. Does that look like Norway in the lead? Eric Langerdal Breivik. Yes, it does. Then Hungary. see France Ooh. and Finland there as well. Great Britain a bit behind. And Gustafsson uh, leaves control number 15. Oh, yeah, I want to stay on this longer because it's very, very interesting to see. But it does look like Norway taking the lead there. I think there and might be Great Britain at the bottom of the hill. You can see the gap now. It's only 22 seconds before it was 44. So a good section here by Joey Hadorn. Yeah, I wonder if some of the others will be able to close the gap well, compared to Gustafsson anyway. We'll see that very soon. And all the teams zooming around here. The drone shot just giving us a good overview of exactly where everybody is going. And Norway into third and with a little bit of a gap now. So Eric Langerdal Breivik making a gap then here on the rest of the field. Kasper Fosser to run the third leg for them. Oxen and Delen also through. And then another gap here. We've still yet to see Great Britain and Latvia through. can go back live and you can see different route choices being made to that 17th control. Mm -hmm. There would have been the, the option to get through the building there uh, on Hadorn's route choice, but it doesn't really matter too much. A bit of an advantage for Gustafsson because he doesn't have to go into this uh, kind of mazy bit too far if he comes from this direction and uh, Hadon has quite many stairs on the way. Well, easy there for Gustafsson and a lot of running now to go on the last few controls. That's where the orienteering gets quite simple at the end but looking very strong mm, but very is he go oh. going now that's a mistake by Gustav yeah that is a mistake should have turned to the left there so now there's another 10 seconds at least he missed. You can see the tail. Just 10 seconds. Now it's only 10 seconds between Switzerland and Sweden. If Hadorn is not doing the mistake. No, he isn't. <laughs> so they're coming back through to this arena by the city walls. And we'll have a look at the gap between the two top teams well we nice. missed Gustafsson go through but it's gone down to 11.4 seconds then and what can Haddon do on the last uh, loop to see if he can try and close the gap and I think Haddon is very relieved now I don't know he, if he noticed that he made a rather bad choice in the beginning but uh, now he's very close and I'm very sure that he will push hard now in order to get closer now he gets of course a good feedback from that split because I'm quite sure that he can spot uh, Gustafsson every now and then and we all know about the speed Hadon has and the two of them have taken different uh, choices to the 20th control maybe an opportunity for Switzerland to close even more time Norway are through though and Finland 
just about a minute down off the leader. So catching on Gustafsson, Delen is also there. And Hungary as well, still within this pack. Ooh. And now we have a gap, I think, back before we see the Latvian team, the British team as well. You can see that they're splitting up again. I think advantage Sweden on that route choice, maybe. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> a few seconds, maybe two or three. <laughs> two or three can make all the difference. But now yeah, they right. are going back through this car park. They're around the corner to go to control 22. So we watch out for the leading team halfway through this relay. Jonathan Gustafsson has maintained the lead for Sweden, but not without difficulty. And Joey Haddon is there too. Now the camera does make this gap seem maybe slightly smaller than it is, but I think Joey Haddon's close a little bit there here. And the top two teams, are, that is pretty much within touching distance, these two. So we watch Sweden come through then, still in the lead. Handed over already, and 5.7 seconds is the gap. A very good second part for Hadorn after this small struggles. He had over quite big struggles on the first route when he almost lost half a minute. Uh, the second part definitely better, got closer and closer. And I mean, in the end, he's very much closer to Sweden than he was compared to when he was running out. So, uh, yeah. Now we can say a good race for Hadorn on the second part, or you can say that Gustafsson didn't really work with the gap he had well. He did quite many yeah, less good decisions on this second part. And of course the mistake just before the arena passage cost him time. Now then, could this be setting up a nice battle for bronze between Finland and Norway? Because uh, Timu Oksanen has had a great leg. He's going to hand over to the bronze medalist from two days ago, Thomas Heikela. And also now we have Eric langadel Breivik handing over to Kasper Foster, the silver medalist from two days ago. Uh, that could match up to be a very, very exciting one as we see France cross the line as well. France, Adrien Delen handing over to Loic Capburn. So very very exciting with a bit of a gap now as well before hungary crossing through another great run for hungary denmark pulled up there i think yeah as the british team has been dropping back through here we've got estonia we've got czechia in the mix Wojtek krav already said one of the most experienced but denmark next to hand over so Andreas Bok Bjornsson out next. Wojciech Kral handing over to Thomas Krivda. Very fast legs there. And the British team should be the next ones across the line. But let's go back towards and this TV control and actually, uh, have Martin McCorn. Actually, Kibbutz does a similar mistake as uh, Hadon did, but a bit worse even because he went into the same... Uh, passage as we had Denmark in the very beginning on the first leg in the women's one you can look here first continuing that was uh, where Hadorn was heading to the east and then Kibbutz gets in the, into this area with the stairs so we'll definitely lose time on this one the gap was only a few seconds six seconds now it's about I would say 25 30 seconds The Italian team hand over in 17th. Yeah. 
So this is the part of the map very, very northwest. And you can see Martin Regborn going between these trees. Here's the chasing group or chasing chasing group. There's a few we've missed a few at more athletes are on this spot. Finland and Norway still battling it out for third place. There we can see how Finland and Norway splitting up. Mm -hmm. Can also see that they will meet each other now at the third control, Sweden and Switzerland. But then Kibbutz yes, will have Switzerland to go to A4. Yeah. yeah. But this will be, of course, a little bit misleading for Kibbutz because now he has seen Rikborn maybe gets the feeling that he is back up in the lead. But actually he isn't because he has to go and take one more control. Yeah, and then he has to go all the way back around the building again. So Rikborn should also not get too worried that uh, Kibbutz has caught him back up. And then you, they'll know that when it comes to these TV controls here, this will be a common control. Just reading his map very, very carefully. I wonder how far ahead he's planning. And this Swedish team, you get the sense that from what Sara Hagström was saying a couple of days ago, that they have really selected this team based on the results from the sprint race. Mm, I mean, if we remember the interview we had with her after the individual sprint, she said that she wasn't sure if she's going to be in the first team, but now with this result, uh, yeah, maybe she's back in the team. And this, of course, says that they hadn't decided before the championships who's going to run it. So they waited for the individual sprint in order to do the selections. I'm sure that they're other approaches by other teams. I don't really know how the Swiss team did it. I think they selected after the sprint as well. Uh, well, there are advantages with doing it early, but yeah, you have a kind of disadvantages as well. I mean, if you select it early, then they might someone might come up with a very good shape or might handle this terrain very well in the individual sprint, gets a lot of self-confidence, and then, of course, you can't change it. Uh, on the other hand, if you know it before the championships, you can start preparing and you can be sure that you have uh, your position in the team. You don't. You may, might have a little bit less pressure on the individual sprint because it's not only... Uh, then it's not also a uh, selection race for the sprint relay. So you can argue and whatever you want. I think if you have a, a, a big team with many runners, then you, there might be an advantage in deciding after the sprint. So the teams now just on the forking, Martin Regborn going up the hill now towards the section by the castle. It's proved quite a tricky one. You can see the different forkings there. This time, possibly, obviously, they've, they've got the different distances of this forking. They will play out for the men. So we've seen Martin Regborn through here. Matthias Gibbert has a bit further to behind. go. They are very mm. much closer now. Uh, this is Fosser and Heikila. They are very close now. Yeah, this now. is a good pair who are working, you know, working really hard, the two of them, to catch up some of that time, I think. Foster has caught Hekula and the two of them really keeping this pace high. Interesting to see how Rick Bourne will handle this 
section here. Seen many of his or the two of his teammates before him struggled a little bit. Seems to struggle Ooh, as well. Yep. Of course, There's it's so a bit harder. On the map here. It's a bit harder as the first runner because the runner behind might see where he's running and can be running with a bit more confidence then. He's I actually think he's enough. done that pretty well. Mm -hmm. Had a few hesitations. But not nearly as bad as some of the others. And now we wait for Matthias Kubert to come through into the picture. But crucially, he looks like he's managed to get through there without the others. There he is, bottom left-hand corner of the screen. There's Norway and Finland, though, on the tails. And you can see just in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that Martin Regwarn has gone down the stairs now. Smooth through there. And back with the leaders, Martin Regborn. Dropping down the steps and out. Let's catch up with the next trio almost. Yes, because they are together now. Trio. Yeah. They've got to go with some levels. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look then. Who's going to come through here in the lead? Will it still be Switzerland? No, it's Norway, then Switzerland, then Finland. A three way battle for two medals here, with one leg still to go. This trio heading back into the town. Is that Finland maybe not quite staying on the backs of the two runners ahead? And now it almost gets knockout sprinty. We've previewing this race, it's not for two days. And now, especially where there's so few forkings, in fact, there's no more forkings uh, on this leg for the men. Had a few more runners pass control. Number 15, France, Czechia, Denmark. And everyone taking the same measures here. You can see that there's the team of Poland in this group as well, but of course not on the same leg. Or not on the same control. Now they're back to three. Again, Kasper Fosser from Norway just staying at the front of that group, descending these stairs here. Control just in the corner, you can just about see it on the drone shot. And now you can see how, how many turns you have to take if you, I mean, we have seen keyboards going there on the first control and you have to take so many uh, kind of turns. So even if it doesn't look so far on the map, you lose a lot of distance, but just by turning back and forth in these small steps there. Oh, so here's the leader, Martin Regborn, going underneath the arch. And he won't know all the drama that is going on behind. More teams further back, splitting up towards control number 17. Mm, 
and the gap before was 42 seconds. Uh, it's still about the same. So it is a very good third leg for Martin Riekborn. Didn't do any mistakes. Of course, this very, very little hesitations uh, up at the castle, but I mean, that was about nothing. Yeah, it's an absolutely ideal, um, yeah, third leg for Sweden, just not making any mistakes, allowing allowing mistakes from Kibbert's behind, uh, allowing the catching up as well, and they've split up the course of control of 20. Mm -hmm. Kibbert's going to the right, Finland and Norway, Heikla and Fosse going to the left. They will have the advantage that they will be able to continue in the same direction. Of course, there we are talking about uh, one or two seconds. It does look a bit shorter maybe for the way that Kibbutz has gone, but look at that, they're just together exactly in the same time. Potential for different routes here as well, but everyone's going to the right. I think it's a bit shorter as we have been talking about on the second leg. When we saw that Joey Hadon went to the left. And then Sara Hugstrom is waiting now for Martin Regborn. This is exactly the position that she'd have hoped to have been in. Can we spot him coming through behind these huge city walls? And plain sailing here for Martin Regborn. After just missing out on the medals two days ago, he's had the perfect leg here and he's going to hand over to Sweden exactly where they hope to be in the lead and with a gap. And with Sara Hagström crowned the new European champion in sprint orienteering, it's looking great for Sweden. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Definitely very good leg by Rick Born. I mean, a very convenient situation now for Sweden. Hawkstrom knows about the gap she has. She knows that she can put a few seconds into the map reading to be sure to have the, the best route choice possible. And uh, for a European champion, of course, uh, 33 seconds should be quite a bit. This is really interesting here. We saw how Thomas Hekeler from Finland just turned on the gas there and got a gap of a couple of seconds over the rest of the field. For so much of that race, it looked like Norway was, and Kasper Foster was the most aggressive one in the orienteering, but maybe paid for that in terms of energy and then you know, gave Thomas Hekeler the chance to hand over to Ven Lahayu in the lead. So we have Ven Lahayu out. We have Eleanor Ross for Switzerland. And we have Victoria Hester Bjornstad for Norway. And kind of interesting, in if, if you look at the GPS, it looked as if uh, Hoxton was hesitating quite a bit out from the start point. Uh, you could really feel from just looking at the GPS how much time she put into kind of trying to avoid to take a bad decision here. Well, it looks like she's executing it pretty well so far. Look, Kat Burn mm -hmm. going to come into fifth place for France. Cécile Colondry It's going to be a great anchor leg for them. 14th place in the sprint distance. The gap behind to those top four is a big one. Denmark, good race there for Andreas Buck Bjornesson handing over to Cecilia Friber Klusner. But let's go back to the leader, Sara Hagström. And pressure is uh, wonder, off with the gap, can but see they can see the... <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really I mean, interesting. This, it's, it's a kind of a strange v angle we have here because it's yeah. more than it looks like. It's about half a minute, <laughs> but of course, just that they see her. No, I don't think it's half a minute anymore. It might be 20 to 25 seconds because she lost a bit of time there in the beginning. But still, it's, I mean, 20, 25 seconds, still a lot. But you get the chance to see her. And that gives you hope, of course, if you're chasing down the leader on the last leg. Yeah, the camera angle always shortens the distance when you're looking at them head on. And the runners coming through here, Eleanor Ross in the lead. Then Van Nahayu, then Victoria Hester-Bjornstad. The others just going the other side. The gap between 
Sweden and Switzerland on, according to the GPS, 29 seconds. You see that Great Britain going to the right. You see the France, Czech Republic and Hungary going to the left. All of them quite okay routes. Yeah, I think as long as you don't make an S shape that we saw exactly. Hadon, Kibbertz, uh, Denmark do on their first leg. Of course, you want to catch a glimpse of the home side, Italy, catching up from 17th to 12th there on that leg. So great, great uh, third leg for them. And we're back in amongst this kind of western part of the map. Interesting here that you can see that Norway and Finland uh, and Sweden have the same forking. Only Switzerland with the A1. Shouldn't be big difference between the different options here. No, they're all the similar distance. I wonder if, again if people will start seeing uh, some of the other runners as well. Well, of course, they saw Zara Hockström now, Norway yeah. and Finland, and they get the, kind of an indication on how many seconds they are behind. Maybe it was a bit faster, the option that Switzerland had, if you look at the GPS here. Yeah, if you remember back to the first leg, I think it, it made some sort of difference on the first leg for Tova Alexanderson having, the, having a, I think, a quicker route through to the fourth control. But here is Sada Hagström in the lead still despite some hesitations out of the start. She's looking very strong and we know her speed is fantastic. She wasn't the most confident about her speed actually in uh, the post-race interview. She kind of surprised herself, I think. She wasn't confident of getting a spot on this relay team. And I think, well, when you're in the Swedish team, you, there's so many, you know, there's, so, there, there's such breadth and depth in that team that yeah you're never going to be guaranteed a selection i think you have to stay humble with that mm -hmm. interesting now the first indication on this one it was 33 seconds at the changeover it's definitely less uh, but not too many seconds and eleanor Nine. ross has got a head after the forking as well So back behind Hagstrom as she climbs up the hill towards control number six. She does cut through the building. There and those stairs there were specifically highlighted in the final details. It almost made you think that there were going to be some levels there, but no. And shortly to control number six, you can see she just looks to her left, looks over her shoulder to, to spot the route up to control number seven. You can always tell that an athlete is planned ahead well when they do those kinds of things. Just wanted to spot the exit route for this control. And this little square here proved a nice place for spectators to go and watch and cheer on the teams as they start the climb up here. Here are the chasers. I can say that they didn't take the option between the buildings. They all go around. 
doesn't make a very big difference, but maybe one or two no, seconds. You can see that there's Elena Roos <laughs> coming out from the control. Yep, so they've all got a sense of the gap. You can really see Ven Lahayu here pushing this pace. Was what is Switzerland doing there? Going on a different route to Control oh. Seven. Yeah, approaching via eight. Yeah. I don't think um, it's gonna pay off, but maybe not too much of a time loss. I haven't seen that before, have you? No, I don't think so. But I, I, I wouldn't say it's too bad. No, it's okay. Can you avoid a bit of a climb? It was maybe? kind of unexpected no? though to see that. Yeah. I wonder how well teams will have geeked this area and it's really hard to, to try and get a sense of how the map is gonna look when you have an area like this. I think the gaps God oh, it's, very it's hard, hard to, to tell. <laughs> it's yeah. really hard to tell, especially as they're changing speed now going up here. Let's watch Eleanor Ross as she just takes another look at the map here. I'm sure we can see Sara Hogstrom. There she goes, just descending the stairs on the right of picture there. And the others will get the edge. The chasers will I have an advantage of seeing where Switzerland have gone. The option that uh, Victoria Björnstad took there was quite good. Oh, Ooh. that's not good. No. Oh, losing time there. It's such a small mistake like that. It's a couple of seconds and they're back together. Yeah, I mean, it was about five to seven seconds of a mistake. So looking good still for the Swedes. We look looking back very to good. the others. Very good. That's the, that's the technical bit done. And we wait still at this control to see actually who's come out best after this melee on the terraces by the castle. Got vineyards in the background as well. Gaps grown. It is still in a Ross. But Victoria Haystad, Bjornstad, Ven Lahayu, not too far off at all. And one of those teams is not going to get a medal. And Ross trying to take a gap there. We've got one more forking. Oh. Some hesitation there, just being extra careful. But the fact that Elena Rose They're all on the same kind of as well. manages to maintain that gap, or at least a gap, shows that she must feel pretty good physically. Uh, because otherwise there's usually an advantage for the runners chasing behind. And for Sweden, it's now only control 14 
uh, and 15 on this first loop left. It's 14. <laughs> well, it's the control where Riekman did a mistake, but he mm -hmm. shouldn't do a mistake here. No, you, Gustafsson it was, of course. It was Gustafsson, not yeah, yeah. And the last loop, very short. Hogstrom skipping past this control on her way towards the arena. And she will get confirmation. Everything is going very well. It is indeed. She rounds this corner. And only four more controls to go now. We've got, a, I, I think, that. a little bit of a chase on for fifth and sixth place between France and Great Britain as well, but... You can also see that the gap here from between Switzerland and the Chasers, in my feeling, I think it's growing a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. It looks like Norway may be dropping off the back as well. Let's see them go through here. Eleanor Ross. 46 seconds, so losing time on Hagstrom. Oh, and there is a gap. Here is Venlahayu. Eight seconds, Norway. exactly. There yeah, is Norway. She. Another seven seconds down. I can see it looks very, very good for Sweden now. I mean, the orienteering part is over. From here, it's just plain running. 17, 18, and 19. So let's focus on the fight behind. I think it looks quite good for Switzerland there. And Eleanor Ross, this is her last, you know, major tournament and her last major championships. This is going to be a pretty dreamy ending for her, especially considering how close it was if she manages to maintain that position. Yeah, definitely. I mean, she did a good race here on the last leg. Uh, we had it, the, the problems for the Swiss team on the second and on the third leg on this route choice to the first control, definitely not uh, here on the last leg where Switzerland loses time. Yeah, it would be really interesting to see, you know, if they hadn't made those those mistakes, those route choice mistakes, had on Anki Burtz both to control number one, would they have been close to Sweden here? But there's a time for Sara Hogström to celebrate with her team. Tova Alexandersson, Jonathan Gustafsson and Martin Legborn. They're going to become European champions once again. This fantastic team here who have led the whole way around. The tactic of putting Tova Alexandersson on the first yeah. leg, getting a bit of a gap. It worked out so well, but there's still a fight for some medals on here. And the decisive runner today for Sweden, definitely Martin Regborn. Mm -hmm. The one that uh, with the stable race on the third leg, they both Tuve and Jonathan Gustafsson had a bit of problems on the way, but very good run from Riekborn. And here, Switzerland definitely gonna save the silver medal. And is it gonna be a yeah. small mistake there for Finland? There might be a small mistake. We better watch out what's going on because I and think Eleanor Ross would have direction. loved the win, but that is exactly what uh, you know she will have wanted to do obviously secure a medal no there is enough gap there is enough space for finland to take the bronze medal and when that bronze medal is so open and we know it's so open in in sprint relay orienteering the finns are going to be delighted mm, definitely and it's the first medal for finland in a sprint relay at the championship Victoria, his debut so I couldn't quite match the pace in the end. And congratulations all round. Are you surprised by the number of, you know, seeing some decisive mistakes there from these teams? I'm, I'm very surprised. I mean, we, we haven't seen so many, well, what we have seen is mistake root choice mistake by the swiss team on the second on the third leg uh that's that was a surprise for me because if you look at the leg 
Um, I think Joey Hawthorne's mistake is, I mean, you can do it, that can happen. He decided right after the start to start point to go to the left, and he saw the route to the right and kind of changed back. Uh, Kibbutz's mistake was definitely worse because he ended up in this back and forth kind of uh, area where you lose a lot of time when you're in there. Um, surprising that I did see that there's an option to the left to me because it's not that it, you had to take the decision right after the start. You had a few seconds, you had about 20 seconds to read the map and decide the route and still uh, that mistake happens, which is surprising to me, yes, indeed. So we have the top six in now, just seeing France and Great Britain come in towards the finish. Here's Cecilia freeberg Klusner coming into seventh. And this is also Hungary here. What a great, I'm hoping this is the best performance from Hungary. I think it probably will be. Rita Maramorosi on the final uh, anchor leg for them. Just crossing the line, seeing number 16 on the chest. Czechia in here now. Teresa Janoszikova, disappointment for the Czechs, especially as they've uh, had much better performances than this in recent sprint relays as well. You could see that Megan Carter-Davis on last leg for Great Britain had closed up uh, with the French team. I think she maybe made some mistakes around the castle area um, and meant that Cecile Calandri had a much better time through there, could get a bit of a gap. Here's Estonia. Uh, who I think are disqualified as a mispunch from the Estonian team, which is why they're not, well, they might not come up in the results. As Everly Karsaku crosses the line, yep, yeah, their team disqualified there. We're back to Austria, running alone here. And very soon we'll have the Italian team through as well. But what a great, you know, shout for Finland to get their, you know, their first ever medal at a championships like this. Mm, definitely. And you could really feel that, uh, I mean, before you had the feeling that something is missing. But now with Heikila, who really took a step forward closer to the very best runners in the world, of course. I mean, he took a medal in the individual sprint. He won the Finnish sprint championships. Uh, he had a great race today as well. And... Once you get one, this little extra kind of bit you've missed before, uh, it can make three or four positions in the competition. And now suddenly, uh, instead of just fighting for a seventh, eighth place, they are now in the in the medal fight. And it was exactly that bit that was missing that they now got in order to be fighting for the medals. But it's also, um, I mean, in a race like this, it's so hard to make gaps. I'm, I'm really surprised that we see so big difference between the teams. It's also in order uh, because, uh, of course, because we have fewer teams than we have in the World Cup. I mean, if you have two or three teams per nations, you have so many teams that it's easier to close gaps again. If you have only one team per nation, uh, once a gap is open, it's very hard to close it again. But still, it wasn't a very difficult sprint. You had one long leg where you could lose time if you did a mistake by but you had to do a mistake a root choice mistake there were different options you could go left and right it didn't matter but if you did this in between thing then you lost time and i'm surprised that we saw that more than once or twice today um yeah otherwise it was very kind of very much what what we expected i mean we had a fight uh, between Sweden and Switzerland in the beginning, then Switzerland did the mistakes, and then we had those other teams we named on beforehand in the fight for the medals. So it was it was not an unexpected kind of sprint relay today. But but I do you think the forkings the... like this forking here had any had any impact on on the race? With the being no the kind no of I don't I don't think one? this this forking didn't have an impact at all the the one to the first control had the, I mean the root choice and the forking to the first control had an impact because there were teams who did mistakes on that one but otherwise what I missed a little bit in this race here is that you try to kind of punish runners um, when they 
don't read the map themselves and follow the pack to towards the wrong control so that you kind of follow to the wrong route choice um and you couldn't do that today because if you the, the forkings were so clear that you couldn't end up on the wrong route choice just by following another pack it was so clear which pack had which control especially in the beginning there so i was a bit missing this element today but otherwise i mean it was kind of an it, it was quite an exciting race for the silver medal and the bronze medal today um anyway uh, but i would wish for more and different kind of forkings but then you know that's that's a that is a kind of approach towards planning that has that has kind of come into almost into fashion and orienteering fashion in the last like few races and we've had planners definitely talk to us about how their intention is to um to do exactly as you said for to punish runners if they mm. follow the wrong pack and don't make their own route choices so you know maybe there's there's going against that anyway maybe up for discussion another time let's hear from the winning team the new european champions in sprint relay sweden the whole team is here let's start with you tova the first leg runner seemed like you uh, Ryan, full speed from, from the start and created a gap, was that the, the strategy? Uh, yeah, I wanted to yeah, have a fast uh, speed from the beginning and but have control of the orienteering. <laughs> so you were happy uh, with your race and the way it went? Mm, yeah, I lost quite a lot uh, in the slope because I had it was uh, tricky and I had some problem to understand where it, I could run or where it was uh, forbidden, so I was a bit uh, too careful there, but uh, otherwise it was good. And let's move on to you, Jonathan Gustafsson, uh, the second leg runner. It looked like quite a roller coaster for you. Uh, 15 seconds when you started out, you had a gap of 45 seconds, but at the end, only five seconds down to Switzerland and Joey Haddon. What was the second leg like for you? Yeah, it was uh, quite a mix, as you say. Uh, I felt in control in the beginning. Uh, I, I looked at the other guys who were quite a lot behind, uh, felt smooth, uh, but then I read to the wrong control and all of a sudden I lost uh, many seconds there, uh, but tried to keep my focus up and then it came another mistake, so I wasn't that happy in the end, but luckily it wasn't that much in the end, uh, down to Yowie, so yeah, still a solid race, I mean, could be better, but yeah, I have a good team, so that's nice. Yeah, you have a good team. One of the, the great legs was yours, uh, Martin Reichborn, third leg. You had uh, the new European champion, Matthias Kibbutz from Switzerland, Switzerland, just five seconds behind you. How was that to go out with him chasing you? Uh, it was nice to get a small gap from Jonathan so I could, uh, I could read the first long leg and I felt I had a good uh, understanding of it. So I just uh, ran everything I had and saw that Kibbutz didn't follow me. So it was really good, felt really good. And then some way into the leg, I looked behind and I didn't saw him. So I could run a little bit without pressure, just take my own time, and so it was really good. I felt uh, very strong the whole way. And that meant that you, Sarah, had a gap of uh, more than 30 seconds down to Switzerland on the final leg. What did that mean for, for your race? Yeah, I really could lower the shoulders uh, when I heard that Martin had uh, such a big gap. I, I know that I run as best uh, when I run alone, so I was really happy to get that from, from my team. Uh, yeah, but then I struggled a bit out from the start point. I didn't get the, the, where the start point was and uh, it was crowded with people. So, so I was a bit confused and then I felt like I took the wrong route choice to the first control. But uh, I guess it was a tricky leg, so uh, several others had problems with that. And I saw uh, just before uh, you went into the arena passage, you looked behind you. Were you afraid to be caught out there? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, right after the first control, I felt like now they can. Someone could have t taken the right route choice and uh, caught me. But uh, yeah, so I, I looked over the shoulder several times, also because I knew that I had a quite big gap. So I just wanted to be sure that I could uh, like really relax in the in the running. But yeah, of course, I was really tired also. <laughs> But you made it, you went through and, and won the gold medals, so all of you congratulations and now uh, two goals for you Sarah, how does that feel here in, in the series? <laughs> I couldn't have dreamt of this, but uh, yeah, I knew we had a really good chance today, so yeah, this is crazy, crazy week. <laughs> and maybe we should hear Martin taking the, the European title from back from the Swiss, how does that feel? It felt, it felt, it's really good, it was the first uh, European champs goal for Sweden, so it's uh, nice to write history. <laughs> Congratulations, all of you. Thank you.
that Swedish team making history indeed. Lots of happy faces there, so they should be. In the end, 36 seconds was that gap after fast and furious racing. Not without a few tech problems, and I and it was interesting actually, Jonas, to hear there what Sarah Hogstrom was saying as how she felt out of the start. You spotted it on the GPS. Yeah, you could see, you could feel a bit of hesitation there. Of course, it's hard to say what exactly the problem is. My guess would have been that she was kind of overreading this first leg because it's a long one. But uh, yeah, obviously she struggled a bit with finding the start point, and then it's very, then it's a very good feeling that you know that you have uh, 35 seconds of a gap when a thing like this happens. Yes, exactly. And she said she could put that you know, that could really put her at ease. And she's quite experienced at running this flat last leg in a position where she's got a gap. Yeah, of course. And she has the self-confidence from the individual sprint. She knows that she has a good speed. She doesn't have to be kind of scared that if she loses 10, 15 seconds, that the others will just run 20 seconds faster on the rest of the course. So I, did, I don't think it was too much of a problem for her. It didn't sound like that either. Is there a standout performance from the whole relay? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned before, I think Martin Rijkman did a very good uh, relay. Then, of course, Sara Hagsum did a good race as well. Uh, well, I'm very impressed by uh, Elena Rose as well, because she you could see that she worked with a kind of three, four seconds gap throughout almost the whole course uh, got the feeling so that you have this physical ability and kind of the technical uh, execution is so good that the others never really get in touch that's that's quite impressive actually but of course she would have wished to have this position where she's really fighting for the gold medal so um yeah it might be a bit an up and down for her but in the end i think she's happy now with this silver medal because we know that there is often the fight between Switzerland and Sweden, and it can go one way or another. And well, someone has to win. So, yeah, I, and maybe a, a, the team as a whole wish they could have done more. But maybe for Eleanor Ross herself on the last leg, you know, from the position that she started in to ultimately end up with that silver has got mm. to be pretty good. Yeah, I think the Swiss team. Uh, I, I think especially. Matthias Kibbutz won't be very, very happy. I mean, Hadon didn't have the best race either, but he was a kind of, he can kind of hide it behind uh, Gustafsson's uh, run as well, because he lost time in the end, so it doesn't look too bad. bad. But Kibbutz kind of, yeah, unnecessary mistake to the first control, really. Mm. Well, we can see the teams there getting their flowers Third place, Finland, Inkonen and Timu Oksanen, Thomas Hekela and Ven Lahayu. Just feels like there's there's more uh, talent, more names coming out of Finland now, especially when it comes to sprint orienteering as well. You can see the, their coach, the legendary Thierry Shoju in the crowd, uh, have been obviously in charge of all of their training and really making a difference now in terms of the sprint. The Swiss team, Simone Absol, Joey Haddon, Matthias Kibbutz, Elena Ross there with their flowers. And of course, the winning Swedish team back on the top of the podium again. Tova Alexanderson, Jonathan Gustafsson, Martin Regborn and Sara Hagström. And apart of all of them, maybe apart from Gustafsson, very, very good races there. So they get their flowers. And I think we'll hear a national anthem as well. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Which I'm not going to try and not to talk over.
You can barely see the so Swiss team one behind. Of the Swedish <laughs> anthem. <laughs> yeah. uh, they haven't quite got the placing of everybody sorted on that stage. Anyway, that was that is pretty much it from this sprint relay. We've seen Sweden take a, another gold. Those are the preliminary standings in the team race. Sweden taking the win there over Switzerland. Norway in two third place you can see all of the standings uh from the team on the iof website later on and uh it's been a great race around the castle here around the streets of suave we've got one more race coming up for these european championships i say one more race it's a set of races for the knockout sprints coming to you throughout the day on sunday it's going to be another exciting one uh, that anything could happen we'll see you then see you then